See, there we go. <laughs> Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thanks Good to be coming. here. It's a great topic. Yeah, I'm very excited to talk about it. Yeah, it's um, it is a great topic, and I so I'm you guys are the experts, so I don't want to be rambling on here too much, but um, I'd like to actually let's start with um, Dr. Aaron just for everybody in case they don't know who you are. Let's just give you a, a brief little overview, and then we'll go right to Alicia. Did you say brief intro? Uh, yeah, brief? my bad. Yeah, like a brief little <laughs> intro, like kind of who you are and what you do. Um, yeah. Everybody knows that they don't know who you are. So I am both an animal chiropractor. And also, I do naturopathic carnivore nutrition, so raw feeding for dogs, cats, and ferrets. Um, and chiropractic-wise, I see small animals, so mostly dogs, but then also cats, exotics, and wildlife. Um, so I'm right here in my clinic now um, after seeing patients all day. And then my nutrition consults are all online. So um, that's pretty much about me. I'm in the Chicago suburbs in Aurora. Barney can't hear you. <laughs> this is the first day of no, I can. job. I hit the mute button. Uh, but a little fun fact about you, Dr. Aaron. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, I was reading on your site that you've had uh, patients come and see you from over 15 different states. Yeah. So, yep. Which is cool. Um, so you're not, not restricted to just Illinois. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, I figured that most of my patients would come from maybe a one to our radius, but over the years, yeah, we've seen patients from over 15 different states. So that's interesting. And yeah, it's a yeah. fun fact. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think that the animal uh, chiropractic uh, space is overcrowded at this point, is it? No, it's not. We definitely need more animal chiropractors. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so Alicia, let, why don't you uh, let us know who you are and uh, why you're on today, and then let's get right into it. Sure. Uh, my name is Alicia Evans. I am a holistic dog trainer, animal communicator, and energy healer. And um, I've been working with animals for the last two decades and have seen everything from behavioral problems to uh, health problems and had an issue with my chocolate lab years ago and wanted to make training safer and easier for dogs because we used every tool and we got injured. So I invented a product called Walk in Sync, and it's a harness and a leash training system that works extraordinarily well to rebalance uh, pulling, lunging, and jumping behaviors, as well as actually help any emotional issues going on with the dogs. And it just really connects the human and the dog in a very simple way that communication becomes easy and training becomes really easy and a lot more fun. So that's me. Cool. And I have no expertise other than um, in the animal wellness space, but other than just being an expert in uh, connecting uh, brilliant minds of yourselves to come together to share with things that matter with people who care. Um, and that's why we're here today. So um, I think, uh, first of all, to kind of kick it off, um, why don't we, why don't you just talk about like the, the, the whole, the, Basically, we'll just start with like, what is the, the problem uh, with call? Like, what, what are the, the problems between the two? So which one of you would like to kind of go first to start with your perspectives about, you know, the difference between collars and harnesses? Dr. Aaron, I'm going to defer to you to lay down all of the, you know, anatomy and all of the pieces of what goes on inside our animals. <laughs> I, yeah, so the reason why I urge my, all of my clients um, to use a harness with their dog rather than a collar um, is because of all that crucial anatomy that's in the neck. If you have um, a collar around their neck and say they pull on their leash, even if it's just a little tug over time, that can cause micro traumas over time. And then if you have a very energetic dog that sees a squirrel and wants to pull you down the road, um, <laughs> that's going to cause some major traumas to the neck. So as an animal chiropractor, my main concern tends to be the cervical spine that's in the neck. So um, you have the vertebrae, you have the discs between the vertebrae, and you have all the nerves coming out from that area. Um, you also have major blood vessels that run through the neck. You have lymphatics that run through as well. So anytime they pull, it's causing some traumas to those areas over time. Um, 
You also Can you talk about the front too? That's so we have, we have the back. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's what I was just about to get to. Well, I think what you're meeting. Um, so you also have the thyroid gland that is in the neck. And most of our dog's collars sit right in front of that thyroid gland. So tugging over time or pulling over time is going to cause trauma to that area. Um, so a lot of times the dogs can have thyroid issues um, from just those chronic traumas to the neck. Um, so you can also look into breeds like labs who tend to be more of the pullers out there out of, out of the breeds. And a lot of times when they get up in age, you hear about a condition called laryngeal paralysis. And um, just simply using a harness instead of a collar on these breeds can help avoid a, a condition like that. Um, and laryngeal paralysis, for those that don't know, um, think of an older dog. Um, it does happen more commonly in labs, at least what I see, in that really heavy, loud breathing. Um, so it, it's caused basically damage to the larynx and trachea over time. So um, the reason I like a harness better is because the harness is going over a much more stable area in the dog. So you have the thoracic spine. The thoracic spine, which is in the upper back, um, has the rib cage. So the rib cage offers some extra stability, and then you have all of the anatomy protected by that underneath. Um, and it just gives a much broader area for any pressure or stress to go around um, rather than the neck. So, um, and usually I'll tell people in regards to harnesses, if you have a dog that pulls, um, a front lead attachment is much better than a back lead attachment. It helps with the training, um, it helps deter pulling, um, and I'm sure, Alicia, you'll probably speak about that as well, since yours is a front lead attachment. <laughs> so um, that's the basic anatomy behind it all. So much less of a chance of an injury with a harness um, versus a collar. Um, if you see my own dogs, they're kind of floating around me as I'm talking here. They do have collars on, but they're used for identification purposes only. I never attach a leash to the collar. Um, so if, say they get lost or something, they have some sort of identification on for people to basically have them find their way back to me, but I won't ever attach a leash to it. Yeah, that's, yeah, cause I had asked you before when we got on, I was like, I'm like, I, it looked like it was for like aesthetics or just for, like for identification, but it <laughs> well, looked like it was, it looked like he was spiffed up. Yeah, like yeah. Kind of, Ar <laughs> Arnie is speaking about, before we got started on this call, my German shepherd yeah. likes being all up in my business no matter what I do and he hopped up in this chair and was looking at Barney through the yeah. screen. <laughs> so. we, were checking, we were checking each other out. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So that's that's really good. So Alicia, why don't you because you know that you have some of the stuff that gets shown on your on your site, but I'm I'm curious because you've never actually explained this to me before. So I'm curious about what your uh, how you kind of came to be with this, you know, going from Dr. Aaron's perspective as a a chiropractor and then to you as the inventor and creator of it it's kind of interesting of, of the walk and stink which is a front lead attachment for them. yeah so um about 25 years ago i had the most adorable chocolate lab who actually shares your namesake um oh. named barney and i wanted to do all of the right things i wanted to make sure you know he was trained properly like any new puppy owner, I had the grand vision of, you know, we're walking down the street, no leash, we're so in sync with each other. And that was so not what happened. <laughs> so we started out puppy training with a choke chain. That's 25 years ago, there wasn't positive dog training. I mean, maybe there was like the, the seedlings were being planted, but um the reality was back then when you were training, literally, if you use food, I really had the fear of God put into me that if I used food, I would be struck down by lightning. Like that's how ridiculously intense it was. So, you know, here I am with this little 14 week old puppy and they're like, well, pop the choke chain. I mean, I was doing what I was told to do, but being a highly sensitive person and being an empath, it never really felt right. But I, I didn't know what else to do. So as we went through training, because the choke chain really wasn't working, then we went to a prong collar. Barney hated the prong collar. He, like, froze. He's like, I'm not going to walk with this thing. 
Then we tried the nose halter. And basically, kid you not, he would scratch his nose bloody to get it off. And at one point, he must have pushed down while he yanked up. And like Dr. Aaron said, there's the cervical vertebrae. So about two days later, I went to touch his neck and he screamed. And I, I like immediately I panicked because back then I didn't really understand about a lot of the healing pieces that I was soon to learn afterwards. So brought him to a veterinarian who happened to be a chiropractor and the veterinarian confirmed he knocked three vertebrae out in his neck. That's why he's in pain. So it really started me in a, a journey of you know, go, I, I was a fitness trainer at the time. So I knew human anatomy and human biomechanics in, in and out. I mean, that was human biomechanics was one of my specialties. So soon after I took a um, massage course for animals and started learning more about the animal anatomy and was still at the time, like not fully able to connect the dots between bodies and behaviors. So here I am with Barney, who really was a different kind of dog. Um, I had a golden retriever who was very receptive, easy to train, really, really amazing. We used to call him the mayor because he just liked everybody. And now I have this chocolate lab and I want to do it perfectly, but nothing's working. So eventually one day I had to go back to the choke chain and I got so mad. I, I didn't know what else to do because here I am being pulled down the street by this 95 pound dog got so mad. I pulled the choke chain really hard, saw my dog wince, broke down on the sidewalk, hysterical crying because I didn't want to hurt this dog. And I didn't know what else to do to get him not to drag me around. So I made him a promise that day that I'd find a way eventually to help people walk and train their dogs and not have to go through the same things that we went through and actually be able to educate people because I didn't know at the time I was hurting my dog. I was just told, use these tools. So as I educated myself more and more and then uh, started getting into animal communication, well, one day when I moved out to Colorado, right, shortly after September 11th, a client asked me to help him train his dog. And so I started applying the animal communication pieces, but I knew that there was a better way than the collar. I just didn't know what it was. And eventually I had another client who presented me with a female chocolate lab who was a total puller. And I thought, well, that's got to be a message from Barney to get on my path to change this. Try to harness in the store that was a front clip harness. Um, and we're going back 16 years. And that was, um, I think, a soft touch or soft, soft concept, soft tech. And it was great because it clipped at the front, except what I started to realize was the, it limited the biomechanics of the dog. So through meditation, I started asking the universe to present me with something, and I was shown a vision for the walk and sink harness. And then that was about seven years ago, and then went through the whole process of designing it, developing it, patenting it, and creating a leash that works in sync with it, because it's not always just the harness. There's very specific reasons for the harness in training, and then there's very specific reasons for a certain type of leash that will help make the training so effective and simple and you know, help your dog um, have the best biomechanics so their structure stays steady. And that is is the path. And I started that about 2010. And um, we've helped over 15,000 dogs since. And it's just, it's been amazing to me because I honestly, I would watch it work when I was there. But I thought the real test is, okay, if I start sending this out and I show people the simple videos, will they be able to do it? And we started getting testimonial after testimonial, like five minutes, my dog and I went on a two mile, two mile walk for the first time ever. Yeah. yeah. What do you say to that? You well, know, uh, Yay. You told me about it. And frankly, I was like, I'm like, not that I would call you a, a you know, untruthful person. I just didn't, I didn't take in the full, I didn't understand. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. Like you use the lead, the harness, harness and the walk and sync system and like it, it changes within a minute but on your website if you guys are curious and you want to see you can go to her website you, you can click on her link below there um and she has or you have uh those five minute manner makeovers where um just good visual um kind of you know exemplifications about how it can make a difference and um, I, I was pretty impressed because I and I ordered one, so it's actually here. We, we it got shipped here when you're in Wisconsin, 
Um, I hope that I got the right size for uh, Lucy because I like taking her out. And sometimes in the morning, I'll go just for little like walks and or a light jog out in our, we live in the country in the farm, on a farm in the country. And it's a long laneway because um, mm-hmm. she doesn't have long legs. So I can't take her. Um, anyways, all that to say without my rambling is that I was, I was quite blown away about how uh, effective it was in visual. So I'm curious to see how it'll work when we get uh, Lucy on it. I'm excited to hear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so thank you for sharing that, Alicia. Now, there's a couple of questions. Um, there's one, uh, maybe Aaron and then uh, Alicia, we can kind of take turns with this. So there's um, uh, how Zen, or how Zen. Uh, I see so many harnesses that impact the gate of the dog. Can you please cover this? I know you kind of touched on it, um, but Aaron, from a chiropractor's perspective, why don't you start with other to jump in on it? Yeah, so there, I mean, there are many different harnesses out there, so you have to make sure that your dog has full mobility. Um, Alicia's harness, the walk-in sink, one of the reasons that I like it is because it does offer the full shoulder mobility. So if you have a harness that has the strap where it cuts across here, rather than, I like to refer to them as the upside down triangle straps on the sides of their shoulders, um, you have to make sure that that's not cutting in front of their shoulder because if it is, every time they take a step forward, it's gonna start causing them to short stride. And if they short stride every time they go on a mile or two walk, then guess what? You're gonna start having musculoskeletal problems. So you really need to make sure that the shoulders have full range of mobility. Her harness is, is it does have that um, to where you can get full shoulder blade motion, full extension up front. Um, so that is one of the reasons why I like it. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. when you see the harness is impacting the gate, usually that's what it is, is where it's cutting across before you get to the tops of the shoulders and it's limiting their gait that way. Um, yeah, that's great. Other ways, it's probably not a good fit for the dog. So looking into things like that um, as to how it's, how all the buckles are um, arranged and the tightness and things like that. But usually it's the shoulders. Good, cool. That's awesome. Thank you, Aaron, for sharing that from a chiropractor's perspective. Um, and now, Alicia, can I ask you, did you, des- like, did you design it with that? I know that you said you kind of had the vision kind of shared with you, uh, just say, you can, here's how the design of it works, but then um, were you, did you build what in what Aaron just talked about, or is it, uh, I'm sure you did, but um, tell us a little bit about that, because this is a great question. Well, it was interesting because um, it was very important to me because a lot of the times you don't want to have a tool that the dog has to adjust themselves around. You should have a tool that properly fits the dog. So one of the things as a trainer that I started to realize was, wow, most trainers have no idea because we're always training the outside of the dog, right? So when I started looking at the anatomy pieces, I thought, we can't do this. Like, this is actually dangerous. And we don't, because it's um, probably looked at as, well, you know, if you fund a study, right, to check on, on this, Who's going to make money off of it? Like you're, you're just trying to prove something, but there is no end deal. And as we, most of us know, most studies need to have an end deal. So as I was looking at this from an anatomy and physiology perspective, just as a trainer, I thought the way that we're, what we're using is so wrong for the dog. And then I started connecting the pieces that, you know, a, a body is an entire system. And I know that our Western medical Uh, the way we look at that model is like all these individual pieces, right? You'll see somebody for your nose, you'll see somebody else for your toe, you'll see somebody else for your elbow. But the reality is the whole system's connected. So like, just like Dr. Aaron was talking about, like the anatomy that you have at the front and the back of your neck, and it's a very, I mean, you can easily damage cervical vertebrae. You can easily damage the thyroid and the, um, the trachea because the trachea is like a cardboard do you know what i mean like it has integrity to it but once you damage it it dies off and you're not going to see these things or look for these things because you're still seeing the outside of a body so super important to me i and it wasn't necessarily like one single thought 
it was a lot of like random thoughts of seeing how all of these pieces connect. And as I meditated, I kept asking for what is the best thing for the dogs? Like, what do they need? What is going to work best? And the first visual I saw was almost like when they put a harness on horses, you know, and they harness them up to pull a sleigh. I thought, oh, my God, right. It, it has to go down here towards the chest because they've got to have free range of motion. It can't affect their cervical vertebrae. It can't affect their thoracic vertebrae. What I landed up discovering through this process, which fascinated me, and this is where I love the fact that I also have the animal communication piece because I can actually ask the animals, like, so what is it for you? Like, how does this feel and does this work? They showed me that the collection point, if you know anything about horses, what they try to do in dressage is to get collection, right? So the neck is nice and long, the, you know, the, the shoulders are moving properly, it lifts the back. And I was like, well, what do you do to collect a dog? Because different animals, right? We have a prey animal and we have a predator. Predators usually are focused on what do I see? What do I have to get? You know, what do I have to do to survive? But when you put a collar on a dog, okay, they can start from their front legs. They have the ability to push into those front legs and they have muscles here. So they can literally sit there and strain on a muscle and not really get it that, that they're hurting themselves. But when you put your finger on your dog's chest and they cannot access their front legs and the power of their front legs to ignore the instinct, they have to actually start turning on their thinking brain, not their instinctive brain. And so like if you even if you put your finger on your body right here at your chest, if you really check in with your body, there is no plate. You can't draw energy anywhere to push through my finger. So what starts to happen is here when you're in muscle, you can stay on it for a long time. But here it all of a sudden brings you back into your body and you have to think a different way. I didn't understand any of this till going through the process of having designed it and then having an awareness to watch the energy and what was actually happening. So I wanted the harness to fit the dogs, but then I knew I had to have a leash because a harness, a front clip harness is fabulous. But with dogs, when you're teaching and you're training, you have to be consistent. Your consistency is what they learn, what they can and what they can't do. Your consistency basically equals boundaries. So I knew that I needed a leash that had a certain amount of length. Because one thing that happens, like if you have a six foot leash, I don't, even your little girl, once she's out on six feet, she can pull you. You know, you're stronger than her. But now think about a smaller person with a larger dog like me with Barney, right? His torque was what I was afraid of. He could pull me off my feet. But if I had him closer, okay, then all of a sudden that distance changes. I'm much more secure in my body because he can't pull me off my feet. So when I designed the leash and made the flat handles on it, I set them at a certain amount because physics dictates the further something goes on on a fulcrum, the more energy you have to use to pull it back. And that's what I was used to seeing as a dog trainer, this battle, right, on the leash. You're pulling, come back. You're pulling, come back. And, you know, the dog just goes, oh, I pull you. That's what gets you to move. When I put, when I attached the uh, leash with the flat handle and it only had it at two and a half feet, and I told the people, just don't move. Just let the dog feel the pressure here that they're creating. I started to watch like miracles happen because the dogs would actually get it and the dogs would change the behavior, not the human. So that's when I knew I was like, this is really actually cool because when a human tries to change a dog's behavior, but the dog's brain is already locked into what they want to do, the dog is not going to remember to adjust themselves. They're just going to wait till they get corrected, okay? Because the brain goes into a locked position and you really can't change a locked brain. Right. That's right. why with dog training, I always wait for that one second when the energy just drops a little and that's when I go in to ask for a correction or a redirection. So as soon as the dogs were on the leash and they started to back up on their own, 
that's when I would tell their owners, go in and praise them for that. Praise them that that's exactly what you want. And so I just kept seeing miracles happen over and over and over. And I started to realize front harnesses, this is the actual collection point to get your dog out of instinct and to get them back into their body and starting to pay attention to you on the other end of the leash. Yeah. But yeah. having that leash to give consistent boundaries, that seemed to be the magical solution. Because, I mean, I have dogs that are voracious pullers. And I mean, big dogs. Yeah. Five minutes. They're like, I get it. Let's go for a walk. Like, and it was what was so cool was it was like, that's what Barney had been trying to tell me. But I didn't understand because I was listening to what somebody else was telling me because they were the professional. And then this whole path has led me on this journey to actually understanding a much deeper level of what's actually happening and how we can change it in a more successful and a more respectful way on both sides of the leash. Yeah, well, it sounds to me like there is a purpose that's gone into the design of the system. There was. And I, I, in, a, in, a, in a funny way, of course, because there's a lot. And I was, I was by the way, when, when we were off the screen, that's why I brought us back on, because I thought if, if, if you guys could have saw how many times Dr. Aaron and I were just like, yeah, like that makes sense. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's... We it's interesting because people always, you know, refer to like nowadays, a lot of dog training is based on the science, right? The science of behavior and all of that is wonderful. But remember, a lot of that science is controlled experiment, you know, controlled research right? that is on a very specific topic. And unfortunately, it doesn't connect the dots of like what actually happens in a living, moving quantum field environment where everything is actually interacting with each other. It's sort of separating out these pieces and saying, this is what it is. It's like, but life isn't a controlled experiment. Life is a very dynamic thing. And if you can get something that works consistently, in that lack of controlled environment, like as I've had to observe with 15,000 dogs, but people are getting the same results. To me, that's the evidentiary science that says there's something that's going on here that they understand, the dogs and the humans. Yeah. That all of our controlled science hasn't, it just hasn't put the pieces together yet. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very interested. I'm curious, Dr. Aaron, um, has that been your experience as well? I know that you uh, like the the walk, like Alicia's walk and sink leash, or part, wow, the harness. Mm -hmm. um, but have you noticed that? Like, tell us just a little bit more from the anatomical perspective or uh, mechanical perspective that the difference of having that attachment at the top, because some of the harnesses, I guess, are. Um, you know, where the, the attachment points at the back and then the other ones at the front. Um, so, I mean, you were nodding your head. So, tell me just why you were nodding your head there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I I like the harnesses that have the front lead attachment. They tend to work better overall. Um, and I think Alicia really did explain it well. She did yeah. more research than I've done on that exact point where it's going to apply that pressure to the dog but I find that a dog gets their leash attached to the back and sometimes that gets in their head okay I need to pull <laughs> straight ahead even harder so it seems like as soon as it gets put up front um, that pressure that it gives um, if they do pull it sometimes I don't know if this happens with your harness but it kind of sets them a little off track a little bit they don't like that feeling they want to be able to have the mindset of they get to go straight ahead. So it really just offers um, kind of oh, basically some balance back and forth. And as Alicia was talking about people where they have their, their dog out on a long leash and they're pulling back and forth. Yeah. It really comes a long way to have a system where yeah. it can offer just that nice calm walk. It's going to offer, um, basically well being both physically to your dog because of all that crucial anatomy that we discussed and even to you because if your dog is constantly having you do this every time you go out and walk them 
<laughs> then guess what? You're going to be prone to a shoulder injury, a neck injury. Um, yeah. Because they're pulling you down the road. And it's not really fun for anyone if that's the way you're walking down the street. So yeah. um, I love that Dr. Aaron put that in there because also as a fitness trainer who had studied human biomechanics intensively, the thing that I realized was as soon as the human body gets off balance, you can, because dogs are such sensitive beings and they can sense changes in energy fields very, very quickly, probably more, way more quickly than humans, as soon as the human's body was off balance, it actually sends a signal through the nervous system that they are nervous, literally, or anxious or afraid. Now, they don't have to even tell the dog that, but as soon as the dog senses that, what the instinct that kicks in in a dog is, it's, it's very simple with their leadership. I'm in charge or you're in charge. Doesn't matter who's in charge. Even if I am an off-balance dog that's not really the leader, I'll still take charge. Right, Even if right, it right. looks crazy, like, you know, the barking, like crazy raging dog with some people go, my dog's an alpha. I'm like, your dog is not an alpha. Alphas are actually calm and relaxed. They're not barky and snappy, but your dog is trying to protect you because they don't feel like you're relaxed and centered in your body. So one of the things that I realized was when the human, when most humans have experience being pulled by their dog, it literally, and this is what happened to me with Barney, which is why I hated walking him. I was afraid. I was afraid, and then I was trying to compensate for being afraid by now being angry. Yeah. And that didn't work. But as soon as I started using the leash and I realized, whoa, as soon as the dog pulls and they're only at two and a half feet and I'm not getting pulled off of my feet. Yeah. yeah. Now, all of a sudden, I authentically in my body feel confident that I'm now in charge and I'm not going to get dragged down the road. And it was so fascinating because I started, as I started seeing that more and more, I was watching, I was like, whoa, it's that one second when the human really regains the sense of calm and confidence in their body. Yeah, and it was yeah. immediately changing the relationship with the dog. So it was fascinating. To watch. So human biomechanics play a huge part in, in exactly what Dr. Aaron said, if you're walking your dog. Yeah. And I yeah, I like the analogy of getting on a bus. So if you're going to get on a bus and you see that the bus driver really is not going to be good at driving the bus, maybe they've um, drank a bunch of alcohol, maybe they don't know what they're doing, they're kind of driving all crazy. No matter if you've never driven a bus before in your life, you're going to say, hey, get out of that driver's seat, I'm taking over. <laughs> yeah. So that's basically what happens with the dog is they'll sense that in the person and then that's exactly what they do. Um, so, yeah, I definitely agree with with what you were just saying. And most people don't realize that literally it is their side of the leash. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the human side of the leash that's generally contributing to the dog's behavior being off because the dog's only doing what they know how to do instinctively. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the people get pissed off at the dog. Like I had gotten pissed off at my dog. So it helped me really understand the entirety of this dynamic of how all these pieces function together, not just these separate little spaces. Yeah. So um, let's, uh, that's amazing. By the way, I just was going to say, let's uh, look at, there's this question. I wanted this a couple questions and get to, it, and then we'll uh, wrap things up here. Um, Keep it nice and short and sweet, but this is amazing. Um, and I think that just from a visual standpoint, um, you know, you can go to Alicia's site. There's lots of videos on there when you see it. Um, it's a bit very visual. Um, I know I, I was able to kind of get it more when I saw one of those videos that you have. Um, SJ was posting on here. Thanks for being patient, by the way. Uh, I have a very reactive uh, South African Mastiff and um, saying that they like go, go, go. And then the next comment here was saying it's tried uh, front attachment harnesses, uh, mm -hmm. collar. Um, he's 122 pounds. So I'm just curious. I mean, my little 
Lucy, I would turn the camera over and show you that she's sitting here sleeping like a little angel. Um, and um, she's, I think, 20 pounds, 18 pounds. Um, and I'm 235 pounds. I'm a pretty strong guy. Um, but I can just imagine if, if a female is out walking or even a guy, anybody really, so I mean, my build or lighter, um, uh, what would it have, what's the heaviest dog that you know of that can go on the harness? Because well, we, we make all, we make an extra large. So we go all the way up to 250 pounds. Wow. So our, um, I would say, did she say it was 155? Uh, 122. 122. I would go with our large. Um, I've worked dogs as large as 180 pound Great Dane. And okay. here's the thing. Mastiffs are known protective dogs. Okay. When I'm training and I have certain dogs, like I see every dog is just like I see every person. They're an individual. However, you do have to still consider that certain breeds were genetically bred for certain things. Right. And right. South African Mastiffs, I'm going to say, are probably more of a guard type dog. So with those dogs, they're very, very cute when they're puppies. They get very large and very big. But you have, when you have a dog that was genetically bred for something at a certain point, it's literally like one day. Now, all of a sudden, that dog is in charge. Right. And right. if the boundaries were not clearly set, that dog could take over and be more protective. That's one part of the equation in terms of the leadership. The yeah. second yeah. thing is if that dog was ever trained on a collar, I would absolutely get a chiropractic adjustment for that dog. Because when I have, yeah, go see Dr. Aaron, you know. Um, so the reason I do that is because I had a shepherd that came to me who's going to be put down. He started getting very aggressive. He had been shipped and trained. Seven trainers said he should be put down. The dog was so out of whack in his back that when I would ask him to sit, it would take him literally like 45 seconds to sit. Called in my chiropractor. Soon as he had one adjustment, the dog was sitting right down. This is my awareness that bodies are so connected to behaviors. And this is one thing, especially in the field of training, that we are so unaware of. Everybody thinks it's the behavior. And I'm like, you wouldn't have a behavior if you don't have a body. So always check the body first. Because vertebrae could go out in the neck, vertebrae could go out in the back. It's all connected to nerves. Those nerves are all connected to organs. And if you do not make sure that you have a sound back, you're going to ask the dog to do something to override what's happening in their nervous system without getting at the root of the problem. So I am huge recommender to chiropractic before we even start training because I wanna make sure that that dog is actually sound. Now, you may not see anything wrong, like, oh, I have to go to the vet, but if you have a dog that's got a behavior issue, first thing I recommend is a chiropractor. Third part of it is boundaries, that's a big dog. If he's out walking in front, and then all of a sudden that day comes when he changes, his human's gonna have a much harder time rebalancing that situation. But walk and sync helps the dog understand because of the fact that it clips in the front, because we've got no, um, we're able to uh, um, accommodate full range of motion. Right. What happens is the dog starts to actually realize how big they are. Sometimes these dogs, like when I had Barney, he didn't realize he was a 95 pound dog and he used to sit on my lap. Like, <laughs> you know, once they start to realize the size of their body and how much space it actually takes up, because a lot of these dogs, I've seen it so many times. I will look in a dog's eyes and I can tell you exactly the age that that dog got stunted and is kind of stuck at. And it usually also corresponds to when a vertebrae went out. Yeah. And once yeah. that finishes and once we clear that and once we simply use walk and sink to rebalance the behavior, you could have a seven-year-old dog that got stuck at three or four months old in their training that hasn't been able to fully figure out how to be a seven-year-old dog. I have watched it in sessions within half an hour. I'm like, do you see how different your dog actually looks? Yeah. People are like, oh my God. 
So I've been learning all of these things as a result of just developing the system. And to me, it's fascinating because these are not things that are talked about in training. The only thing they really focus on in training is behaviors. Right, and I'm like, right. behaviors, it's like alphabet soup, right? Behaviors are like the alphabet. It's 10% of it. The right. rest of it is understanding the energy, the energy in the body, the under energy in the connection. And that's 90% of it. Yeah, well, I think that a lot more to it than meets the eye initially. So step number one, uh, take your dog to go see Dr. Aaron O'Connor. Yeah. <laughs> and if, if you can't, they can look up a directory. Yeah, There's a yeah. Yeah. Well, They're the, practice. <laughs> I know. I'm just, I'm giving you a totally. shot here, of course. <laughs> Um, but we will we'll post that because I, I know that the question will come up or that if yeah. people will watch us after and think, okay, great, but I don't know that, where's the closest animal chiropractor. Yeah. But but to summarize what you said, Lisa, because I, I do agree as a uh, corrective exercise specialist myself for humans um, to do that and then get the walk and sync system because they can go hand in hand. Because maybe even even if you do, maybe you have the walk and sync system or you have a heart, a front lead heart, another front lead attachment harness. Um, or something, and it's still not. Maybe you're not feeling like you're getting the most bang for your buck in the experience. Mm -hmm. and it could just be that there's a subluxation that's in um, your dog, and that can contribute. Um, so, a couple. There's been some more questions rolling in. Let's let's. Um, there are a couple more. Let's do these. We'll do them like rapid fire. Um, so, for both of you, you can just chip in and give a couple quick tips. Um, is what can you do for a dog that doesn't settle down while riding for a long time? Um, and we've been taking him. Uh, quite a few breaks with them, but he's shaking wines. Now, I don't know how that will directly relate to the harness, but um, so Alicia, what's your tip? And then let's ask uh, Dr. Aaron. Sure. Two things in there. One, I would get the dog adjusted. Honestly, I think that dogs should be adjusted at least twice in puppyhood and then at least once every six months um, because you don't know what you don't know, right? And our eyes as regular pet owners are not trained to see subtle perceptions in like, whoa, their shoulders don't look even, or their hips look a little bit off. What I would recommend for any animal owner, just look from the top of your dog's head, look straight down to their tail when they walk. Do you see a straight line or do you see certain offages? You know, certain that are a little more wiggly over there or the hair looks funny, like it doesn't look straight and flush. That to me is always just by eye, I'm not saying anything's wrong, yeah, but I'm yeah, just yeah. saying your dog's spine should be straight. That's the way they were designed. So if you look from head all the way down the spine to tail and you see or feel something's a little bit off, I would get your dog adjusted. Now, that's one part of it. When dogs, I notice when dogs shake and whine, sometimes they've had, you know, it could just even be in a collision or, you know, when dogs are puppies, you don't realize that they could have tripped or they could have post hold in the snow or something happened they're fine but you don't realize it may have pulled something off a lot of times i see dogs where they've had like a shock a little bit of a shocking experience and it literally pulls the diaphragm up a little bit and the diaphragm gets stuck a little and when that happens the entire nervous system sometimes gets off and the dogs um, because of their breathing and their respiration, because that goes out of whack a little bit, it doesn't allow them to fully settle down into their stomach. Right. And when we're settled into our stomach, that's when we're calm. So the okay. first thing that I would do is a chiropractic adjustment for that dog. Second thing I would do is put the dog on a harness because I'm gonna, I'm going out on a limb here, but my animal communication side is telling me this dog actually walks in front of their humans. And what happens is if their constitution is not the actual leader, they're going to be a little more nervous and the dog can't help it till they have the clear boundaries uh, reestablished. So I would use a walk and sink harness once the, um, if you can get a chiropractic adjustment, I would use the walk and sink harness then to balance boundaries and it's going to help the dog feel safer in their own body. <laughs> Yeah, and as dogs do, they, they, you know, they do what they do. <laughs> it was funny. There was a, yeah, Lucy was, Lucy was did a little bark. She's like, what's going on there? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that, that's okay. So, okay, that was really good, Alicia. Uh, very thorough. Now, um, Aaron, what would, or Dr. Aaron, what would you say? Um, yeah, I mean, 
she covered my side of things too. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was sitting here and I was just going, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Good confirmation. But, yeah. but yeah, I mean, if they're not going to settle down, um, there could be something that's bothering them. It's just like, if we have a headache, we're not going to react to things the same way as we would if we're feeling really good. Um, so making sure that you're checking all of those things. And I even agreed with how much she said to adjust with, with puppies. Two times um, through puppyhood is usually what I suggest. Um, giant size breeds, usually a couple more. Yeah. Um, and then the longest six months is great. The longest I tend to recommend um, is every three months because it doesn't allow anything to sit there for too long. Exactly. It gets back four times a year. Um, yeah. I certainly better, or even one year is certainly better than nothing. Um, because a lot of times they do have things going on that the dog owner won't know about um, because they're just watching their dog. They The dog is still going to probably play and run and things like that. Um, no matter if something is just a little slight annoyance or maybe a headache for them. Um, so it, it really gives a very good detailed check on everything in their body. Okay. Can I also explain a quick point? Chiropractic is more going to be based on preventative medicine. So, so usually we go to a Western doctor. I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm echoing. Why I'm echoing. You might need to turn a little bit. Okay, so okay. Western, so medicine Western medicine is going to help you in an emergency situation. Chiropractic is going to prevent a lot of emergency health situations. Okay, so what we want to do is really start looking at our dogs like the way that we would look at ourselves. We want to make sure everything stays aligned because like Dr. Aaron said, all the vertebrae are hooked into nerves that are hooked into organs. And when we are taking a preventative stance, unless of course we have something like an emergency, right? God forbid the dog tears his ACL or breaks a bone, very different than these chronic health issues that we keep that we seeing in dogs like cancer and organ diseases and arthritis. A lot of these things can, can really be staved off and this is why even as a trainer, I'm also a health advocate because I see how much you've got the vaccine equation, you've got the um, food equation, but you also have the training equation. And training, and training is training. you're doing on an everyday basis with your dog, whether you know it or not, that's going to help them find a calm, relaxed energy, which isn't going to be, you know, creating excessive behaviors and excessive behaviors can also lead to health behaviors and health issues. Right. So yeah. it's always yeah. good to, you know, follow that model of integrating chiropractic because we don't think about it like horse people think about it more because they ride on the back of a horse, right? Yeah. But dog and, and cow don't think about it as much. And right. so it's really important yeah. for us to start thinking this way because we can keep our animals healthier way longer and way less expensively and way less invasively. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. I agree with you and I'm getting the feedback now. Aaron, I've <clears throat> muted you because I think maybe try turning your speakers down um, just a little bit on your, like actually on your computer because I think it's a big screw in and to your mic. To your mic. Oh. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's okay. Uh, but that was really good. So, Barb, hopefully that worked uh, for answering your question. That was very good. Um, now, a couple more because there's a bunch more topping up here. Let's just wrap up and then we'll uh, wrap things up because we're really going to do 20, 30, and then do an hour, even an hour, double over time. Um, how, do you, how do you harness your uh, sitting down? Uh, sitting down. This question right here. How do you harness training sitting down? Down. I'm not completely, not completely sure, sure, what, that sure means. what that means. I Maybe think they're meaning the dog is on leash while they're training these things. Training, sit down. So, training. Kathy, if you're still so on, if you're still on, then back on and back uh, on and uh, clarification for your question. For your question. Uh, Maybe she means how do you, she means how do you help your dog with help sitting? Your dog with sitting harness. harness. Well, I'm just not sure. Well, I'm just if not, it's, not sure if it's. Do you want the dog calm when you're putting on the harness and leash? Or yeah. 
how are you training for sit and down while the harness is on? That's the only clarification. One of the reasons why I actually like the harness is because I'm huge about patience exercises. I'm huge about building patience into my dogs. I don't mean into them, but teaching them, you know, to be calm while things are going on. So they're not reactive. Yeah. And I've yeah. seen so many times helping so many of my clients, puppies and dogs, like they learn to just relax when the harness goes on. So it creates a state of as the harness goes on, we are calm and relaxed. Um, but I, again, I don't think I'm properly addressing, addressing um, that. And I, guys, I'm so sorry, but I have my friend's dog with me and he has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's so okay. He's, he's been telling me for like 10 minutes. I'm like, just hold on, just hold on. Okay. All right. Well, there's a, there's a bunch more questions. Maybe you can go through and, and um, uh, answer them after then, Alicia. I think this Absolutely. is really to talk about. There was really, it was just uh, the dog's previous harness um, uh, had the front clip and she would bite the leash on walks. Will your harness leash help? Yes. You? That's that's something I will make a video about because I teach like when the puppies grab the leash and stuff, I take ownership to say this is my leash. We don't bite it. Right. So right. sometimes I will do a quick jerk out of the mouth because just a little uncomfortable. They don't touch it. But that's where I use um, the, the energy of leadership training, which I also teach about in my heart and soul of uh, dog training course. Okay. Because I teach the energy on the human side of the leash. So many people are looking at the dog, the dog behavior, the human behavior that's actually good. affects dog behavior. So that's, I teach the human side of the leash. Okay. And last okay. question before we run away, because I think this next one is going to be for Dr. Aaron and then we'll wrap it up and maybe you'll come back before then, because I don't know how long this question is. Um, and oh, then the gonna, rest of yeah. we're not going, to get to, uh, not going to be able to get to all of them, but maybe Dr. Aaron and, uh, or Alicia can answer them. And guys, by the way, if you have some Feel free to reach out to them. Um, I'm sure yes. we'll to help. Um, and um, Aaron, we're going to share that link um, if you can, the, where people can find the closest animal chiropractor. Uh, but last question for you is this one right here from Christine uh, Alicia. Is you bu um, she's bought harnesses and uh, they never fit uh, mm -hmm. my Yorkies properly. So are they small yeah. enough? That they'll fit. Yeah, we our harnesses start at four uh, for four. Our extra small harness, which is typical Yorkie size, goes from four pounds to um, eight, uh, about 13 pounds. And if she needs a special one made that has an even thinner webbing, we can make her a custom order. Oh, cool. So she can contact us at walkinsync.com. All right, go take that. You know, the mess in the house. Um, and um, thank you so much, Alicia, if you want to. Oh, I thank you both. Dr. Aaron. Dr. Aaron. Oh, sorry. I was just saying, sorry, we've had multiple dog interruptions here on my end, too. Yeah, OK. <laughs> right. They just want to join right. in. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, then, Alicia, so if you want to jump off, I'll, there's a couple of questions I want to get. I want to get out to Aaron. Aaron, thank you so much. So much. You You're so welcome. And I'm Facebook Live. Facebook Live. Live. Yep. And I will and answer I the questions, answer questions on the questions page. On page. Okay, sounds great. Sounds great. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. All right. See ya. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so I think. Okay, so I think. Yeah, I can. I yeah, can. I can. Come back through your, back through your speakers, but it's. it's I don't know. Sometimes it's kind of hard to tell. Um, but, but so, so this, this, this question, this here, question from, here from. Yeah. Um, 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 yeah, this doesn't really relate anything to harnesses. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it can yeah. certainly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you can certainly try because, say, the nerves um, aren't signaling properly, then you could have various organ dysfunction. Um, so yeah, I would say it's worth a try. And usually, with a condition like this, I would look to the sacral area and the pelvic area. Um, but yeah, any. Just generalizing any sort of organ dysfunction since chiropractic affects the nervous system and the nervous system controls every single organ, tissue, and cell in the entire body. Um, if we're improving that function, a lot of times you get things like that to clear up. So, yeah, certainly yeah. try for parathemosis. That's great. Um, and if people, so they're.
listen, like, okay, this is great, but if I'm in Southwest Florida and Dr. Aaron is in Illinois, um, what is that website again that they can look up to see, find the closest animal chiropractor to them? Yeah, it is avcadoctors.com. So it stands for American Veterinary Chiropractic Association. So A-V-C-A, doctors. And then, and is it D-O-C-T-O-R-S dot com? Yes. So A B C A Doctors D O C T O R S dot com, right? Yes. Okay. Then I'll um I'll post this um on here. I'll post this after. Yeah. <laughs> um I'll put that on there and then thanks for sharing so much. Yeah. Um there's again thanks for um jumping on here guys. Uh I'll I know Alicia there's this other question here about proper fit. Jennifer uh, Ackley had said that, you know, she um has the walk and sync harness and the strap pulls of the side if it's too loose. Um, but I can tell you, uh, Jennifer, that Alicia is very passionate as you were able to observe um, about the walk and sync system. So if you wanna reach out to her through the website, she, she'll probably help you and jump on the phone with you. She's been known to do that. Um, and then this other, uh, Melissa, you were asking about, um, can you use it for the strength of a 150 pound dog? Um, and she said it goes up to 250 pounds, which do you think dogs get up? Like, would a dog, have you ever had it? What's the heaviest dog that you've ever treated? Uh, around 220 pounds. Wow. And what kind of dog was that? Um, I've had a couple Mastiffs come in around that weight um, and a St. Bernard that was a little large for a St. Bernard. Wow. Uh, wow. So, yeah. And I, I I do see a lot of giant size breeds. So, <laughs> That's a lot of them big, big, big. way up in the 180s and 200s. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Really, really appreciate your time. And Aaron's Aaron's but I want to give. I want to give her a hug. Go to her. Go to her. And check her out. If you're close to her, her. I'm just going to mute you for one second because I'm getting some feedback again. If you're close to her practice, you can go see just Dr. Aaron O'Connor. You can see the link there. Um, she has a very interesting practice uh, and lots of other things that she does as well. So go check her out. Um, and or if you have people, friends in the area, send them there. Or if you want to make a road trip, you can. Or go to the website um, that I am going to be posting here where you can um, find an animal chiropractor that's close to you. That's close to you. So thanks again, Dr. Thanks Aaron. Again, Dr. Aaron. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Yeah, for thanks, everybody. For and you yeah, come in and come in. And, um, uh, hello with any other questions that they can answer in the future. In the future. Uh, and for a friend that they can call. Have a great weekend, guys. Have a great weekend, guys. Uh,